So we are here, episode seven, Alhamdulillah. Um, we are with our esteemed guest, Brother Daniel Kikaju. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him for answering our call on a short notice. And uh, for the viewers as well, just to clarify, we never invited him after he gave his shahada and testimony very recently. <laughs> we, we invited him, Alhamdulillah, on the basis of, mashallah, his knowledge and the work that he's doing. Um, so I know it's going to be uncomfortable for Daniel, but for our new viewers and especially for the uh, British viewers, I think it would be very appropriate if Brother Daniel could just introduce himself um, however he wishes, inshallah, so that you can just get a feel of what you, your background and what you do, inshallah, please. Sure. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all the viewers. Jazakallah uh, khairan for having me. Uh, on this uh, wonderful podcast, very happy to uh, be here. Um, um, as for my background and introduction, uh, I'm in the U.S. I am the founder and uh, basically editor-in-chief of MuslimSkeptic.com, uh, which is an online website that addresses uh, modernist doubts and current events um, from the standpoint of Islam and and uh, Muslim opinion. Um, I'm also the founder and uh, director of Alesna Institute, which is an online uh, platform for uh, teaching Muslims how to fight back against modernism and liberalism and feminism and all these other isms that uh, threaten Islam and threaten Muslim faith in the current day. Um, so I'm mainly uh, busy with those two uh, endeavors. We also have a channel, Muslim Skeptic, uh, on YouTube, and we publish debates, we publish documentaries, um, we publish a lot of different kinds of reaction videos, again, addressing these main topics of uh, modernism, liberalism, comparative religion, and all for uh, defending Islam and raising, you know, the banner of Islam and doing dawah. Jazakallah, alhamdulillah. Um, that was very detailed, alhamdulillah. Uh, I don't know because we're short on time. Unfortunately, we can't take it to the five hours. Uh, but we will, inshallah, try and squeeze as much as possible out of yourself. Um, with respect, of course. Uh, the first topic that we want to discuss with yourself, inshallah, is um, feminism. You know, um, we see, especially in UK and around the world, how th this wave of feminism has attacked the Muslim Ummah, especially in a way that it's actually diluted itself and it's entered into Islam in a way that our own Muslims have come to a point where they will use the Quran and Sunnah, especially the life of Khadija radiallahu anha, the life of many of the Sahabiyat, and they'll present that in a watered down fashion and say, look, this is what X, Y, and Z did. Therefore, I should behave in this manner. Um, husband needs to behave in this manner because Khadija did this. Or, you know, do they present Islam in such a way that it's it's been overlaid with this feminism? Uh, for, for the benefit of our viewers, um, Brother Daniel, if you can just explain briefly um, what actually feminism is, because there's a lot of women out there um, who they'll... they'll push this whole agenda, and then at the, at the end of the day, they'll put their hands up and say, look, I'm not a feminist. So if you could just describe very briefly what feminism is to our viewers, inshallah. Feminism just means a opposition to patriarchy. So to understand what feminism is, you have to understand what patriarchy is. Patriarchy just means the rule of men and the authority of men within society, within the family, within the community. Um, this is what patriarchy is. Feminism, feminism says, no, this is invalid, contrary to justice. We have to have equality. You have men in authority. Women should also be in authority. You have a husband. He's, he's not the head of the household. It's a partnership between husband and wife or husband and husband or wife and wife, you know, because they accept all kinds of, you know, quote unquote, marriages and families. This is um, the main core of what feminism is. So um, the fact of the matter is that Islam is patriarchal. Islam establishes that men are the heads of the household, men are the heads of 
communities, men are the heads of society as a whole, uh, government as well. Uh, this is something that is very clearly established by the Quran, uh, where Allah says, And uh, the Prophet also uh, when it comes to overall society, um, because of the Sahih Hadith of the Prophet where he has said, that any people who put a woman in charge of their affairs um, will not succeed. And so this is clear Sahih Hadith, and the ulama throughout Islamic history have all interpreted this Hadith in, in the same way, that men are in charge, men should be in charge within society, and uh, women do not have that role. So Islam, there's no question, is patriarchal. The Nusus, the Quran, and the Sunnah, it's very clear on that and 1400 years of scholarship and ulama have all interpreted these ayat and ahadith in the same exact way the feminist comes and says no this is bottom <laughs> this is false this is in a, this is invalid there needs to be equality between men and women so this is a, a very major attack on <clears throat> the core of islam core teachings mm -hmm. of islam Okay, Alhamdulillah. So this brings us on to our second point now. Now we have uh, various definitions, uh, various new uh, words coming to the surface. This word masculinity and toxic masculinity. So is there a differentiation between toxic masculinity and masculinity? If you could, inshallah, uh, just touch on this. Jazakumullah khair. Masculinity just means, uh, in Islamic terminology, means rujula or also muru'a, which can be translated as a kind of chivalry. Um, so masculinity is a value that is promoted by Islam very clearly. And the greatest man and the most manly man was the Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, his example is very clear in his manliness. Uh, and there are certain features of being manly. Uh, being manly means uh, having shaja'a, having bravery, which we see from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we see from the salaf, we see from the ulama, they have this bravery that is distinct for men. It's Women can be brave as well, but it's not the same as the bravery, the shaja'a that a man has. Because the man is supposed to go in the face of danger to protect the interests of his family, his community, and ultimately his religion. Uh, he has to go and fight in the face of danger despite fear that he may have. This is a praiseworthy aspect for men, but it is not praiseworthy for a woman <coughs> that if there is danger that she throws herself uh, in front of that danger for the protection of the community, for example, or when there are men present, when there are men present and she you know, throws herself in danger. Now, if she wants to protect her children or protect herself, that's something separate. But in the context of a community, to th go and fight or to stand in the face of danger, that is praiseworthy for men. Uh, other qualities of responsibility, of leadership, these are this is all masculinity. Uh, being someone who has uh, constancy. Uh, being someone who is not going to be rattled by emotion, someone who controls his anger, controls his emotions. These are all part of rujula and murua that are specific to men. Whereas women, if they are emotional, that's their nature. And that's not considered to be something that is uh, a negative quality for women. But it is a negative quality for men. It's contrary to rujula. Um, so, and then many other aspects that can be detailed, but the point is that all of this is considered toxic <laughs> by the modern feminist discourse. Um, you can call it wokeism, you can call it whatever, but even the American Psychological Association has deemed it or has, has judged that mas masculinity is a kind of a mental disorder, <laughs> And they they list certain things of like what is what is mentally dysfunctional about being manly. They say things like being stoic, uh, not you know expressing your emotions at the drop of a hat. You know, being more as I mentioned, constant and keeping your emotions in check. This is considered a psychological problem. 
toxic, according to the APA. Um, having ghira, uh, having this kind of protective jealousy of your woman folk, of, of your mother, your daughter, your sister, not wanting others to see or talk to your, you know, your wife, this kind of protective jealousy, which is one of the uh, very beautiful and important values within Islam, this is seen as toxic. This is seen as uh, we need to get rid of that. You should have no problem as a man if your wife has a, has a boyfriend. You know, you don't own her. <laughs> you don't own your wife. She's an independent person. If she wants to go sleep in another bed every night, that's that's her judgment. She's a free person, and you can't control her as a man. Or you want, or your daughter. You want you want to keep your daughter from experiencing, you know, the all of the experiences in college and in uh, you know the club or the dance floor this is out of your toxic masculinity and your patriarchal understanding of fatherhood and this is to be wiped out this is something that is a psychological disorder in reality this is natural like any human any uh, human male that it has you know fitra has a basic humanity uh, will protect his wife, protect his daughter, will have protective jealousy. This is a very common, natural, human, universal human emotion uh, and in, instinct. But now that's, this, is the, this is the problem with feminism, is that it distorts human nature and it attacks. It's attacking human nature as being toxic, as being destructive, something that needs to be wiped out and rewritten and changed. So Islam is actually far closer and, and perfect with perfect alignment with our natural state as human beings, the fitrah that all human beings were created upon. It, and this man-made ideology of feminism based on pure hawa, pure whims and desires has come to destroy what is good and pure and natural. And therefore it is Islam for them is enemy number one. So, you know, uh, when you mentioned about, um, obviously, when you go back to the points, I think this is going to be a good question to ask yourself. Um, you get a lot of people, especially the, the or, well, we call them the coconut Muslims. Uh, they they come and present this excuse and say, look, um, you know, you've mentioned about feminism and the, the fact that um, Islam demands patriarchy and, you know, there needs to be a leadership role. Um, but then they give that argument and say that, okay, if that's the case, why is the West so successful um, in terms of leadership, in terms of governing? And on top of that, if you look at uh, the role models, they have equally given a platform to the males and the females. And the hadith that you quoted, um, just for our viewers, it's, it's an important authentic narration where the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that that nation can never be successful who put their affairs on the this is I'm just paraphrasing on the shoulders of a woman meaning she takes on the responsibility whereas this this is a hadith but then we contrast that to the present day world that we are living in and we see that there's many women who are successful in their endeavors. Um, there's countries, there's um, MPs, there's there's leaders who are f feminine, sorry, females, and they actually were successful. So what answer would you give in regards to that, so where people are pushing this argument? The success in terms of dunya of the Western world and like the European empire over the past, um, we, we can say 300 to 500 years, this was built on the backs of men. Uh, this was a built on the backs of men. Look at the United U, the United States, the history of the U, U.S. How many female presidents has the U.S. had, actually? Yes, yeah, Subhanallah. Um, what are, who are the majority of the lawmakers and the leaders or rulers of these Western nations? They've been predominantly men. Uh, there hasn't been any kind of de uh, deviation from a patriarchal model, even in the Western world. Now, in the current uh, age of the past maybe two or three decades, we see more women taking these leadership positions. They are taking positions of leadership in, in government as heads of state. They're taking leadership positions as lawmakers. They're taking leadership positions in the major corporations and the major businesses. And coincidentally, we also see a decline 
in Western civilization, and many are calling, you know, calling the end of the West of the superiority in terms of dunya of the Western civilization um, in in our time. We are seeing the collapse before our very eyes, and coincidentally, is it a coincidence that it's coinciding with the increased uh, position of women? <coughs> in society and in these leadership positions. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think this is the sunnah of Allah as the Prophet Sallallahu has very clearly laid out for us. The Prophet Sallallahu in his, in this hadith, he's giving a law of nature, basically. A law of nature, I mean it metaphorically because the, everything that happens cannot happen without the will of Allah and according to his sunnah. So this is something that we see over and over and over again and, and the present... Western civilization, Kafir civilization, is no exception to that. Uh, just adding to uh, a few of the points Brother Daniel made. Uh, yesterday when we were discussing this point of uh, Rujula, one verse come to my mind. Uh, another, I won't call it extreme, but what we're seeing amongst the youth in, in England and possibly the, uh, what you call the USA also, is people take masculinity just as you can say uh, archery, horse riding as he is, alhamdulillah. Uh, many other things such as grappling, uh, training for boxing. Like obviously, we don't accept box, boxing to be permitted as a sport in itself. Uh, the verse that come to my mind is uh, part of rujula and being a, a man uh, and uh, masculinity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, fi buyutin adhin Allah an turfa wa yuthkara fi hasmu yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghudubi wal asal. رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار. So we see, Alhamdulillah, a lot of people are taking masculinity as uh, as these things as certain sports for men. They forget about the spiritual aspect of masculinity. It'd be nice if you could shed some light on this, inshallah. The spiritual aspect of masculinity uh, it applies. Like shaja is a spiritual value um th because it comes from uh inside it comes from having taqwa of allah having yaqeen in the promise of allah uh, having confidence in the promise of allah that you go and you fight for the sake of allah for example or you defend um you know the honor of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam you know that is something that come that is a spiritual value and um, it doesn't mean being the biggest and the strongest, even though the Prophet ﷺ has said that the strong believer is better than the weak believer. And many have interpreted this hadith to refer to physical strength. So there is a physical component to it. But at the core, um, having this kind of rujula is, a, is coming from uh, spirituality uh, because it requires yaqeen. If you don't have yaqeen in the promise of Allah, you don't have that fear of Allah, then you cannot act, you cannot take action, you cannot lead, um, you, uh, you cannot be a man in the truest sense without having, uh, you know, that spiritual component. And this is what we see from not only the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not only the Sahaba, but from the awliya of Allah as well. Um, they're the ones who are representing the true uh, masculinity that we should aspire to this kind of uh, there's this common um, meme or this common portrayal of masculinity and this has to do with the popularity of his figures like Andrew Tate or the popularity <laughs> of certain red pill narrative and masculinity means being a kickboxer and you know exactly. uh, unbuttoning your shirt <laughs> you know down to the navel <laughs> and uh, or being a UFC fighter <laughs> yeah. smoking a cigar like this is just a, a show right but masculinity i i think shaja is really very critical to it ghira is very critical to it um having haya is also critical to it as well look at musa alayhi salam in the quran and especially when he is uh, assisting the daughters of shuaib the prophet shuaib alayhi salam and look at his haya in dealing with that situation uh, as described by Allah in the Quran. The peak highest level of haya that he has, this is a part of rujula. And he's able, uh, and this, this is how he's described by the daughters of Shuraib, that he is 
He is Qawi, he's strong, but he is also reliable and trustworthy, honest. So this is, you know, these are the masculine characteristics that we see from the Anbiya and we see from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so, 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 so. from the Sahaba. Um, but of course, it's definitely spiritual and it's not just this show that we unfortunately find uh, in in social media. Malana, just uh, sorry, before you got to get to your question, just for the audience. So from this, we realize, alhamdulillah, spirituality is very, very important in our lives. Uh, and I just uh, Quran ayah I mentioned, having a connection with the masajid, it shouldn't be just with the gyms or the places we go for kickboxing or where we go have, uh, what do you call it, uh, other type of sports. Yes, this is part of our masculinity, but at the same time, shuja'a, courage, spirituality, alhamdulillah, haya, all these things are important ingredients. I mean, all these ingredients are added, inshallah, this will bring out a true man, inshallah. Yeah, okay, adding inshallah to what uh, Daniel said was, uh, it's, it's the next point that we want to talk about is, you know, obviously feminism, toxic masculinity, whatever you want to call it. Um, you have all these other traits as well. And now, unfortunately, we've seen um, a very strong, powerful wave of um, changing your gender identity as well, like literally in America. And obviously, Brother Daniel will know much better of this, but I do remember reading an article where you can identify with literally anything. There's a person who, asked, uh, there was an article where he's identified himself on the passport saying, um, person X, you know, subhanAllah, it's a Jeep. He's, he was actually... X, his name is X. So, you know, these things, um, what would you say, Brother Daniel, is what what is the core foundation that has brought these things about? Personally, obviously, we probably agree with me. It's, it's actually living under a secular state. Um, you know, this has had a large impact upon Muslims as well. So before you mention your point, inshallah, if you can explain what secularism is and how it's actually impacted the, the, the Muslim Ummah at large as well as the communities where Muslims live, inshallah. Sure. So secularism means that the government and the laws of society are determined by atheists um, and that no religion or beliefs in God can affect the government or the laws of society. Only atheism can rule. And everyone else has to submit to the rules and the laws and the governance, the social policies of atheists. And the trick that the atheists have pulled is that they claim that this is the most fair system. This is the most fair to everyone. If they rule and everyone else is subservient, this is a delusion. This is a trick that they have uh, pulled the wool over the eyes of, of so many, unfortunately. Um, and and they have you know certain terms like separation of church and state. This is what it's referring yeah. to. So this is something completely contrary to Islam. Islam, when Allah sends the Sharia, uh, He has sent the Sharia through the Quran and the Sunnah, and it's been preserved for fourteen hundred years through scholarship and ulama and tradition. Um, this is not only a sharia that determines what an individual should believe and an individual should practice in his home. This is also guidance and it is uh, laws uh, and practices for all of society uh, on the governmental level, on the societal level, on the communal level. And this is the kind of guidance that Allah has sent, a complete way of life. When we say Islam is a complete way of life, we don't just mean you praying in your own, privately in your own house. We also mean guidance for, okay, how do you uh, get married? How do you engage in proper gender relations? How do you determine your family? How do you raise your children? How do you organize your community? How do you establish uh, salah or ritual prayer? How do you establish a, a just economic system? How do you establish a just, just governmental system? All of this requires guidance, and without the guidance of Allah, without the guidance of the creator of human beings, human beings are going to be lost, and they're going to be wandering blindly through the darkness. So this is why Islam is a light for all of humanity and a guidance for all of humanity, and that's the Sharia. Secularism says, no, this is all uh, uh, canceled, this is all false, 
you want to practice Islam, practice it in the privacy of your home, own home. Let the atheists rule society. Let the atheists control and dictate to everyone how they should live their lives and the law and the economy and marriage and family. Let us, atheists, on the basis of our so-called rationality, our so-called science and intelligence, we'll dictate to everyone how they should live. And you better obey. You better obey and uh, accept our rule. Otherwise, we are going to sanction you. We're going to drop bombs on you. We're going to drone you. We're going to uh, starve you to death or deprive you of critical medicines that you need unless you accept our rule, the rule of atheism. And this is the, you know, the gun held to the head of the entire globe, not just Muslims. Uh, the entire globe either submit to atheism or you will die. And they've made it very clear. And we can look at the, the largest uh, um, examples of bloodshed, killing and death of the past 20 years has been against Muslims. Look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, look at Libya. Look at uh, Syria. Look at all. Look at what's happening to Palestinians. All of this is based on uh, many factors, but the main factor is submit to the rule of atheists. And if you don't, then we'll kill you. You know, uh, just adding to that, what you mentioned, I think this is going to be beneficial for our audience. You know, when we talk about these, this subject itself, to um, because at this moment in time, uh, we're actually disobeying the state by speaking out so um what advice would you say give to um the muslims at large um and especially the imams um and obviously when we give our advice it's not that because it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody becomes an imam and he's um you know he has the power of allah and nobody can give him any advice of course everybody deserves to listen um and listen to a reminder as well uh, reminders are always beneficial for the believers but especially in britain what we're seeing is that um, a lot of people actually believe that their religion is enclosed inside the four walls of their homes and they'll do their ibadah their salah and this is what the government british government loves this is what they want this is what they demand from us as soon as you start speaking out like yourself mashallah the activities and the work you're doing um this is where a problem arises for these people where they'll start looking and saying okay um he's not for following our protocol therefore we need to start um putting strict um put him under a strict regime and you know try and squeeze a life out of him not physically obviously but through procedures so would your advice be that we just carry on doing this staying in our homes doing our ibadah building our masajid i'm not talking about these issues but actually addressing them what would your advice be inshallah well we all uh, have to obey the law and um as long as the law is not contradicting what allah has commanded um so we we obey the law and i think that in certain parts of the world uh, there is more or less restriction on what can be said and what can be taught um, the job of ulama and basically every muslim is to preserve the teachings of islam um, as much as possible and that means that you can't just avoid teaching a certain topic because it is unpopular or because it will bring social sanction. And currently in the West, in most countries, you can teach every part of the Quran. You can teach every aspect of Islam without necessarily uh, there being a crackdown. This is changing, however. This is changing. Um, you see in the country of France, for example, that the French government has actually deported imams because they teach certain ayat uh, that contradict liberal values or feminist values. Um, you see also within the UK or in Canada that schools will lose funding or they'll come under pressure from the government uh, if they teach certain things or they uphold certain standards of Islam. So we see these kinds of actions, and this should not be surprising to us. We, sh As Muslims, we should recognize that the um, disbelievers are constantly trying to silence the truth and to erase the truth. So that is something that has always happened since the beginning, beginning of Islam, but also with secularism itself. Secularism claims that it 
respects freedom of religion. Muslims should recognize that this is a complete lie, that there is no freedom of religion by the very structure of these secular societies. Because I, as I explained in, in before, that practicing Islam is not just in the privacy of your own home. Practicing Islam is an entire system uh, that extends to the government. But we aren't able to practice Islam in these countries, in secular countries, and increasingly in the Muslim world as well, in Muslim countries. We're not able to practice Islam in its in the full sense. Uh, so what? Where is the freedom of religion? Okay, this is just a um, this is just propaganda to blind people from the reality from the reality of the oppression, and we cannot be blind to this oppression. And the reality is that the oppression is getting worse and worse. And the way to dis, the, to understand it is like we're in a glass cage. We're in a glass cage, and some of us do not see the bars of this cage. We don't see the bars, but they're there, like constraining us and limiting us. And this cage, year by year, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And how are we going to react to that? And how can we resist that? Is, is hijra going to be an option to leave these countries? Maybe that is going to be a requirement. Look at, what's again, what's happening in France. Um so this is a question that I don't have the answer to, uh, but we have to be aware of the reality that freedom of religion is no guarantee. It's never been a guarantee for Muslims and things, you know, I wish I had good news, but the reality is things are going to get worse. Okay, you know, moving on to the next point, um, and then Molana, you can, inshallah, put your, add your masala, inshallah. Um, so, you know, we've got the state, the head is here, um, and they're obviously dictating, they're passing on the rules, regulations. And then when that trickles down, you have the compassionate imams. Um, and these guys, you were talking about France, subhanAllah. And uh, I remember, I think it was last year, You maybe you might have come across it as well. There was a um, French imam who said, don't say Allahu Akbar, say France Akbar. He's, there, was a, yeah, there was a video, there's a brother, um, he sent it to me. So... You've got these compassionate imams who are obviously altering the religion, they're distorting the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, you define them as simps as well. So for our audience, I think, <laughs> could you please just elaborate on that and uh, who they are and what they're doing, especially in America. But what we do feel, and we were discussing this, me and Molana, that the, the wave has already reached Britain. This the, the whiff, like they say, when America sneezes, then... Um, you'll always feel the vapors in Europe and especially Britain. So we're already fe feeling this. There's a plenty of compassionate imams. We don't want to name and shame them today. Um, we'll leave that for another time, inshallah. But, um, you know, what, what would you define as what is a simp and who they are, inshallah, or what their job is and what they do? Simp is, um, it's, there's nuances with all these terms, you know, compassionate imam, someone who's a compassionate imam is not necessarily a simp and vice versa, but uh, a simp basically is um, a, a term for the person who compromises on Islamic principles for the sake of appearing very kind and gentle to women. So being kind and gentle and compassionate and merciful, these are important qualities and values within Islam, no doubt about it. Uh, but we cannot, but Islam doesn't tell us to be uh, merciful and kind and gentle all the time, no matter what, unconditionally. There's no such thing as unconditional compassion or unconditional mer mercy within Islam, and we do not see this from the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In certain cases, he was very gentle and kind. In other cases, he was harsh. In other cases, he would have to raise his voice. In other cases, you know, it's not just all mercy and kindness. So to truly uh, embody and practice the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can't just take the kind and compassionate parts and ignore everything else. Uh, but someone who is a simp uh, will ignore these other aspects of Islam and the basic Islamic principles of rujula, for example, or qawama in terms of the, uh, the authority of men. Uh, they will ignore those aspects of Islam or they will actively try to distort them 
and water them down and sugarcoat them. So this is, they are attacking Islam for the sake of being liked, <laughs> for the sake of being liked by women mainly. Uh, so this is this is their attitude. This is contrary to Islam, and they just bring humiliation upon themselves uh, in this life and in the next by taking this kind of approach of throwing Islam under the bus. And so we use a kind this kind of humiliation, this uh, derogatory term for them because that's what they deserve. And we have to stigmatize this kind of behavior. The reality is, other communities, uh, these other like Ahlul Kitab. The Christians and the Jews, unfortunately, they had like the re one of the main reasons that they liberalized in their history over the past 200 years is because uh, they had figures like uh, uh, pastors and priests and rabbis who would come and say, oh, we have to be compassionate. We have to be merciful. We have to be tolerant and kind unconditionally. And we have to treat women better. And we have to treat women like queens and things like this. They would say the kinds of uh, speech that appeals to a liberal audience, to a liberal culture, to a liberal society. And they would compromise on their own religious principles and their own beliefs. Like the claim to say, for example, that, oh, the, uh, you know, we have to be, and, and you see some imams now, these simp imams are saying things like this. They'll say that, well, we have to treat our women better. We have, our women, Muslim women have been abused for so many years and so many generations. We have to be better. We have to treat women better. The implication of this kind of speech is that for 1,400 years, know, Muslim enough. women were mistreated. They were abused. They were oppressed by our fathers and our forefathers it's and previous enough. generations. And we are going to. We are more enlightened. We are. We, are, we understand the Sunnah and the Quran better than uh, the previous generations, and we're going to treat women better. So this is actually undermining and discrediting our tradition. It's discrediting the ulama uh, of our tradition. It's discrediting the salaf and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. So this is very dangerous for Islam. The Jews and the Christians they ended up liberalizing because they continue to put this compromised discourse and preached it from their churches and their synagogues. We can't follow them down the lizard hole. We have to say, no, this is simping. This is contrary to Islam. This is feeding into a liberal narrative. This is feeding into a progressive narrative. We reject it. We want to preserve our deen and we want to preserve our traditions. Okay, so you know some people, they'll say... Um about yourself, especially talking about um, sometimes you do approach. Um, your approach is quite harsh. Uh, and I don't think I'm the best person to be saying this to yourself, but um, here goes. Uh, some people do say that, you know, you're, um, you're quite harsh in your approach. And you did mention, obviously, that the Prophet ﷺ was never like this. There's no doubt about that. Um, but, uh, and people do present the sira, love, having affection. Um, what would you, what answer would you give to them? I mean, because there's probably a plenty of people who are watching this now as well. Um, and there's probably a lot of women as well, maybe. Um, so I think if you could address that, inshallah, I'm pretty sure that you must have addressed that through your writings and other videos. But, you know, the, the, the balance and explanation of how there needs to be severity, there needs to be harshness as well as um, softness as well. Yeah, I don't think I'm too harsh. <laughs> I think I'm very gentle, actually. Uh, you know, it's only it only comes off as harsh uh, because for those who are used to this kind of sugar-coated, watered-down uh, preaching that they've been hearing for many years, the people who have been raised on that kind of uh, nonsense, then anyone who just plainly speaks the truth is going to be seen as too harsh or too aggressive. And, you know, this is, it reaches the point where even reading an ayah of the Quran or reading a hadith is too harsh. They say, oh, this is too harsh. Uh, what do you mean it's too harsh? I'm just reading the Quran. 
I'm well, just citing you a, a, a hadith. How can citing a hadith be too harsh? That That's what it means to convey the that, deen and, and teach people the deen. Hey, so when you say that it's too harsh, you're hey, actually hey, criticizing hey, the Quran. You're criticizing the Prophet ﷺ. So what, what's the status of that kind of statement? And that's what actually happens. Uh, you find amongst these compassionate imams, and we say compassionate in the sarcastic way because they're not really compassionate. They're driving people to hellfire, basically, uh, with their distorted teaching of Islam. Uh, but you'll see that they will avoid mentioning certain ayat. They will avoid mentioning certain hadith. They will not convey certain ahkam of the sharia. Uh, because it contradicts liberalism and feminism. So they are doing exactly what uh, Allah accuses the Bani Israel, for example, of doing, or Ahlul Kitab of doing. Uh, you're teaching part of the book and you're hiding part of the book. Uh, this is We see this from some of these imams today, where they will uh, cater and uh, uh, censor their message based on what is socially pro popular. This is This is a problem. So if... These individuals would uh, speak the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Then there wouldn't this be this impression that, oh, someone like me uh, just cites a hadith or speaks, you know, in a certain way. Oh, he's too harsh. No, this is look at the kind of speech that, you know, someone like me, uneducated person, ignorant person like me has. Let's cite some of the things that the great Emma of history have said <laughs> about uh, women or about, you know, the disbelievers or about, you know, the uh, fosak, the, the uh, sin, open sinners or the mubtadi'een, uh, the innovators and deviants and zanadiqa. Let's, let's, bring their, let's bring their statements uh, and see wh who is more harsh, right? But there's that context is has been uh, left out because the people judge what is Islamic or not on the basis of a social media education, what they've seen from popular compassionate imams on social media. They think that's what Islam is. They're not going back to study with a qualified scholar or a qualified imam who will bring the statements and, and the, the books of the previous ulama and read their statements exactly what Okay, what does this tafsir say about al rijal qawamuna an nisa <laughs> You know, what, what did uh, Imam Ghazali say about, rahimahullah, about this uh, ayah or about women, you know, and marriage and, and wives and how to treat the wife? Let's, let's read those <laughs> or let's see what Imam Malik says about these and then we can determine who is, who is really harsh or not. Well, I'm just, uh, just adding to that, uh, what if, like, let's say, hypothetically, uh, our audience, especially our youngsters, myself, alhamdulillah, have a lot of affiliation with youngsters, 18, 20, early adulthood, uh, mid-30s. They say, obviously, to reel in the crowd, we use a soft approach. And this is, obviously, this is something I don't agree with. Alhamdulillah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, as in, there's, there's a text there, there's a hadith there. Why are we only citing those which are used for love, compassion, we see the seal of the Prophet Sallallahu was a mixture of many things. But these so-called compassionate imams would say, we're reeling in the crowd, we're bringing in the crowd, and after that, the truth will be presented to them. So how, how would you answer to the question like that? As, and just adding to that, like just recently, before coming to this podcast, we see a lot of people, they link this to mental health as well. Because mental health, and when they see a lot of dispute, amongst, uh, especially on online, amongst the speakers, influencers, possibly scholars as well. They say this it goes uh, and, and it affects their mental state. Whereas when it comes to these quote-unquote compassionate imams, what happens is, subhanAllah, it helps with their mental well-being, well -being, sorry, and it assists them throughout their life. I hope this question makes sense, inshallah. Okay, that's that's a funny uh, thing. <laughs> Um, let me address the first point and I'll address the mental health point. But the, the idea that you can be popular, like, first of all, why is that the concern? Um, why should popularity matter? Uh, sh the priority is to convey the truth and to convey Dean properly 
And some of the, when we look at the history of the MBA, some of the MBA had only one follower or they had no followers. Um, but th should they have compromised? Should they have changed their message? Should they have softened it or watered it down to appeal to the masses? No, of course not. So the actual numbers are irrelevant. Um, that is not uh, what we will be judged upon. We'll be judged by Allah according to conveying the truth, uh, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two is that uh, it's actually false to say that if you have a soft approach that you will gain popularity. Uh, this, is, this is categorically false, has been proven false. I can give you actual studies that show that, uh, for example, the churches in, and, and religious institutions within the United States, there was a study of thousands of these churches, and they graded each church on the basis of how strict or harsh they were versus how liberal and accommodating. You know, the churches that say, uh, yes, every Saturday or Sunday at um, 6 a.m. you need to be in church. You have to be dressed in a certain kind of dress. We separate the men and the women. We don't have any kind of music. We are just going to read the scripture. This is a very harsh church. And then you have another church that says, oh, you know, stroll in, you know, whenever you want, uh, 10, 11 a.m. and dress however you want. And we have some rock music you know, singing about Jesus and we want to just make you feel good and help your mental health. Uh, those kinds of very liberal churches. Which churches do you think grow their membership and which churches are dying? Which churches are losing their numbers? Which churches end up closing down and which churches end up lasting for multiple generations? This particular study found that it's the strict churches. It is the, the churches that are the most exacting in their standards that they have. And the researchers explain this by saying that, well, these strict churches are offering a religious experience that the, their followers cannot get anywhere else. Whereas the churches that are so liberal, you know, they have the rock music and they have the dance party and they have the Halloween trick-or-treating and they have all of these <laughs> cultural things. The people who go to these churches think that, well, this is what I can do anywhere else in society. I can go listen to music and go dance and uh, do trick-or-treating and, and have all kinds of fun with the opposite sex. I can do that in anywhere in society. Why do I need the church? This church is just telling me that all of these activities are perfectly fine and perfectly godly. So why waste my time in this church? The church is not actually giving me anything of uh, significance or uniqueness or value. There's no unique value proposition of this church. I'll go elsewhere. Uh, so this is the explanation of the researchers for why the strict churches last. But this is something that you can also notice uh, just more casually. You don't have to read a study. Look at the popularity of Andrew Tate, for example. Uh, he is someone who is seen as a misogynist. He is someone who is seen as harsh. He is someone who is seen as uh, very uncompromising in, cer in certain things that he says. And look at his popularity. The thing is that people recognize a faker. People recognize, oh, you are just a sellout. You are just saying things uh, for mass appeal. And people are disgusted by that. And even if you have a limited popularity, for those who are concerned about popularity, even if you have a limited popularity, for a short amount of time, five years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, then people will forget you. Why? Because the times will change. Times change, the, this culture, the society becomes more liberal. Then you have to adapt and become more liberal. You have to water down things more and more and more. And people realize that you're just you know, playing a game. And those people who follow their desires, they will just leave you and find someone who is more accommodating who's more gentle, more kind, who says, you know, oh, you don't even have to pray five times a day, or why even hijab, why is that necessary? Or, you know, you have exams in Ramadan, you have exams, or you have something important like a job interview in Ramadan, don't worry about fasting, you don't need to fast. 
So, Allah bless you. Amazing point. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I think you know another thing. Wanna before we go on to um, there's there's a section there's there's two important points which we want to discuss inshallah. But um, talking about harshness and uh, we've been uh, we've been sent your post, mashallah. Uh, women's education, uh, Taliban government. So uh, many people obviously consider them to be very uh, extreme, very harsh in their approach. Um, so I mean, what 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 answer would you give or what's your take on this? issue on um, because it does connect it with feminism as well and we've seen the whole West totally go against them despite taking their fundings despite giving their money uh, over to the 9-11 uh, victims their family members uh, despite the fact that that money that they've taken away belongs to the Afghan people um, they've not batter eyelid for that they've focused upon women's education and all of a sudden the coconuts the liberals the secularists have jumped on this the bandwagon and they've said no this is not what Islam Sharia talks about um, and they in, and naturally what happens is a lot of our Muslims due to ignorance they they um, mix the two points together they've mixed feminism uh, women's rights equal opportunities and they've taught that Islam and Sharia um promotes this, whereas what they don't realize is it's it's a um, barrier that's covering them for them to actually truly recognize what Islam has spoken about women's rights. So women's education and the Taliban banning the, the women from going to universities and educating themselves. What would you say in regards to that? So I don't endorse any particular government, any government, um, and I don't speak on behalf of any government or endorse any government uh, like the Taliban or anyone else. Um, but, you know, I've spoken about this issue of uh, women's education. I've actually had a debate on this topic that you can find on uh, the Muslim Skeptic channel. I've written a couple of articles on uh, women's education as well. And I've always or I've been opposed to women's education uh, basically since I was in college <laughs> myself. And there is just uh, you have to have the proper understanding of what education is. Um, and so this is one of the arguments that can be made. There are many arguments. And I recommend anyone who's interested to go watch the debate that I had uh, on the topic. But we have to. Understand if you could just mention the debate by, by title, if you remember, if you can't, it's all right. Just so uh, for the viewers, inshallah. It's like if you go to Muslim skeptic on YouTube, it's right there on the front page it's like feminist debate i think that's the title okay debate. Sure. should women go to college something like this and i give many reasons and explanation for why women going to college uh, specifically and empowering women the empowerment of women is something that's detrimental to society uh, every, any society not just muslim society um, and there are many statistics that show this um, there's statistics that show that women, as women are getting more and more educated in society, their own mental health is suffering. Like women's mental health is now at some of the lowest points in terms of depression, in terms of drug abuse, in terms of suicide, in terms of needing antidepressants. Um, women are at their lowest point now, and they happen also to be the most educated that they've ever been the most educated, the most empowered that they've ever been. Why are they saying that they're so unhappy? Um, so that's like just with, with regards to how women themselves feel. Feminists have to explain this contradiction. Uh, but also there are negative outcomes for society as a whole when you educate and empower women. And it, to just sum it up in a nutshell, uh, the way that Allah has created human beings is with a patriarchal system. As we mentioned before, men are in leadership positions within the family, within the community, within society. And if you contradict that model and that way that Allah has created humanity and the way that all human societies have been, Muslim and non-Muslim throughout, throughout human history, 50,000 years, 300,000 years, they've all been patriarchal. You contradict that model. Of course, you're going to be depressed. Of course, it's going to be dysfunctional. Of course, you're going to have all kinds of social problems. Of course, the family is going to break down and be destroyed. Of course, communities are going to be ripped apart, you know, at the seams. And that's what we see, unfortunately, in the Muslim community in the U.S. In the Muslim community in the U.S., 
women are increasingly the boss. <laughs> you know, all of these queens and boss women are running the masajid in the U.S. And it's been a complete disaster. It's been a complete disaster. And then you have simps or you have these, you know, compassionate imams that just step aside and they delegate all responsibility and authority to women. It's been a disaster. Okay. And we can go into the details of why that's the case. But <clears throat> going back to this question of what is education? What in Islam, what in Islam says that education is necessary or there's some kind of value uh, in education? You have to first define your terms. What, what does education mean? And some of the people who now are arguing for women's education and they're arguing against Afghanistan, for example, they say, you know, education, they conflate it with ta'aleem. They conflate it with an, with uh, ilm in the Islamic sense, which is beneficial knowledge, knowledge of deen, uh, the obligatory knowledge of, you know, how to tahara or salah or uh, fasting, etc. These are obligatory aspects of knowledge of deen, knowledge of the Quran, knowledge of the sunnah. This is all... Uh, the kind of ta'aleem that, of course, no doubt, there is benefit and value. Uh, and this is the best knowledge. But you cannot conflate that, ilm, with uh, education in the Western sense of the word education. The Western educational system, that model that has been created is very unique. And it has had a very specific purpose. It was developed in the Enlightenment period, about 230, 240 years ago within France and Britain and Germany. And this educational system was pushed by atheists and deists who have left Christianity. They said that the population needs to learn science. The population needs to learn certain kinds of high art. Um, they need to learn Shakespeare. They need to learn you know, this certain kind of literature and they need to learn science and math. Why? Because this is going to bring our societies to enlightenment and these myths and these, you know, fairy tales of religion and, oh, scripture, religious scripture, this is garbage. This is what is holding society back. This is what is keeping us in the dark ages. We have to throw this, these traditions and these fairy tales in the trash. Instead, we, edu we don't send the kid to learn, our children to learn about God. And, and the Bible or about religion, we, we send them to learn science and math and logic. And we, we have them read Shakespeare and this kind of secular literature. This is what is going to uh, benefit society and the individual. This is what education is. This is what education means. So why would any Muslim adopt or, or uh, pursue education? There's two reasons that you can pursue that education. One reason is that you really ag agree with the atheist enlightenment thinkers that this is something that in and of itself is beneficial. In and of itself, it is good. In and of itself, Allah wants you to study this uh, because there's something inherently valuable about learning Shakespeare or learning about Beethoven uh, and, and whatever subject, liberal art subject and learning science. And there's something inherently good in and of itself. Or you have a pragmatic reason to pursue education, which is most Muslims. You need to go and pursue a career in order to survive, in order to, to make money for your family, uh, because you have that responsibility as a man. Uh, or maybe a nation as a whole wants to pursue education because they want to defend themselves. Like they want to, they have to develop certain kinds of technologies, weapons in order to prevent <coughs> attack and destruction from opposing forces. So these are the only two reasons why an education might be necessary. And none of them involve women. <laughs> none of them involve the first option to think that this is inherently good. This is inherently valuable. Uh, how? Like, where's your dalil for that? Where is the Quran? Where is, the, where is Allah or the Prophet وسلم, praising so that, nice. that idea of education? Where? That specific definition of education that we see has historically developed within the enlightenment. In fact, you find many, you'll, you'll arguably find many proofs against that type of education, that this is actually something that will take you away from Islam. And that's what we see, like people who go for 12 years pursuing education of this nature, 
this secular model of education, uh, a large percentage, unfortunately, they become, they leave Islam. Why? You're being indoctrinated by atheism. You're being indoctrinated by an atheistic model. That is the whole point of that educational system. As I described, they designed it to create an atheistic society, which way they consider to be enlightened, where they consider to be rational and logical. That's what that <coughs> whole educational system is designed for. So what kind of Muslim would want his to push other Muslims or his daughters or his sons into that, you know, that, that shark-infested water, that cup of poison? Yeah, of course, drink this cup of poison, no problem. Like what, what Muslim who knows this history and the nature of that education would willingly uh, put his children into that and promote that for Muslim society as a, and as a good in and of itself? If you want to say, okay, this is a necessary evil, this is a necessary evil because we have, to, we have certain practical ends that we have to pursue, um, like providing for family, pursuing these kinds of jobs that require you to get a certain uh, degree or a nation that has to create certain infrastructure to defend against attack, for example. It's a necessary evil, and we're going to mitigate against that through certain means. Uh, then that seems to be the clear option, the clear rational approach that any Muslim would take. And one of the mitigating factors is to say that, okay, only the people who are required to pursue this education uh, this secular education should be should be allowed to take it. Only those who are necessary and necessary is are the men. The women and daughters, it's not necessary for them to be put in that danger, to be exposed to that threat, to be exposed to that secularizing influence. So th this is one of the kinds of arguments that can be made. It just goes back to definitions. What do we mean by education? Is this something that is actually endorsed? In Islam, what is the actual history, the intellectual history of these concepts? Muslims cannot be, uh, you know, naive about this history. We have to investigate and be critical and be skeptical. Just uh, <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, very very insightful once again, brother Daniel. Alhamdulillah, many things I've learned from this. Alhamdulillah. Um, just one question that comes from this. So there's a few questions that are flying around in my mind. Uh, one was obviously we see when, when we put these uh, proofs forward, the Quran and the Hadith forward, the definition of education, then you'll get uh, possibly the compassionate imams or brothers within our society and a, a large uh, group of the women saying, uh, we're looking at the word zurura here now. And I, I, this is something not my stance, but like I said, they would use this term of zurura. For example, a woman, she falls pregnant now. She's gone to the hospital to take a scan. She needs to visit a doctor. If we restrict women or we stop this woman's education, then subsequently what will happen is these women can't go see these women doctors. They can't go see these women GPs and it becomes an hindrance for, for the women. So what an answer could you give to that? Uh, and also within that, if you could touch on uh, homeschooling, obviously there's an opportunity for us here in the UK as well as in the US where parents can homeschool. But we see there's a, a large group uh, in the Muslim communities here in, in England, places like Birmingham, possibly London, Bradford. We have a lot of parents, firstly, coming from abroad, where one person, parent is English speaking, majority of the time the fathers, they're busy with work. The mothers don't have much affiliation with the homeschooling. Or at times the women or either one of the parents are not uh, educated enough to homeschool their children. So if you could just answer all this in one. I know it's a few questions uh, given all at once, but... Alhamdulillah, I know you touched on all, all, all the, the questions, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Yeah, so in the debate that I had, I specifically addressed the, um, this common response of, oh, what about women doctors? We need to have women doctors, and this is darura. Um, fine, you know, if this is uh, darura, uh, then there can be a, a segment. You know, how many female doctors do you need to serve the population? How many, what percentage of women need to be educated in order to produce enough doctors, enough female doctors and medical practitioners for the Muslim community or for society as a whole? And the answer is you need like 0.0001% of women. Uh, that is sufficient. That is more than sufficient to have female doctors. So we should endanger 
the 99.99999% of our daughters and our Muslim women put them in, you know, this secularizing uh, uh, system, educational system, uh, just so that we can get, you know, comparatively handful of female doctors. This is irrational. This is something that uh, really Subhanallah. The numbers don't add up. You know, why can't we have like, why can't uh, a country like Afghanistan or any Muslim country say that? Yeah, we do need uh, female doctors. So we'll see if there is certain aptitude. You know, you have a uh, you put all of the your daughters in the madrasa to memorize Quran. And, you know, there is a ranking system that some of these daughters are memorizing Quran very easily. They have a very sharp uh, ability to memorize. Take the top 1% and offer them, okay, do you want to uh, pursue a medical degree uh, for the for uh, this fard kifaya, this communal obligation? And some of them will say yes, some of them will say no. Those who say yes, okay, give them uh, a certain customized curriculum that abides by the sharia, that keeps them modest, that keeps them separate. Get them married at a young age and having children as well, you know, a- according to a very natural human progression of life. But they're getting the education. They're getting that medical education that they need. And then, you know, they'll become female doctors, and at the same time, you'll preserve the 99.999% of daughters. You won't endanger them um, in, in by putting them in a standard educational, Western model educational curriculum. Like, why can't... That's a simple <clears throat> solution. But they, people are not going to... Some of these Muslims are not going to entertain that obvious solution because really they're not worried about the far kifaya and modesty. <laughs> they're not concerned about like gender separation. These are people who are constantly... Uh, slamming gender separation and they want ikhtilal, they want to mix the genders but suddenly like when it comes to education oh the women need women doctors okay <laughs> how convenient uh, what a convenient argument but it's a very simple solution and then the other thing is that a lot of these people a lot of these liberals and feminists they they're promoting female doctors because it's a prestigious position but actually, in, when it comes to childbirth, for example, or uh, many kinds of medical problems that women, like the most common medical issues that women suffer from and they need female assistance, like a female physician, it doesn't require being a female doctor. Um, there are other positions like being a nurse or being a, a midwife, for example, midwives who deliver babies. And that doesn't require this, you know, 12, 15, 18 years of secular education to get those positions. But those are not prestigious positions socially. They're not as prestigious as, oh, my daughter is a doctor. To say, oh, my daughter is a midwife. But where where are these liberals advocating for Muslim women to become midwives or to become nurses or to become, you know, these kinds of positions that don't require that same level of education? You don't see that kind of argument because those those positions don't come with the same level of prestige. So that tells us that their arguments are not in good faith. They are just trying to use this to push secularism and pr- push this kind of feminist liberal perspective. And it's very easy to debunk uh, this kind of nonsense. Jazakallah for that. Um, I think we'll move on to the next um, Category, I think, and that is a question answer session, inshallah. We've got a lot of questions coming in uh, for yourself. There was um, a repetition of the same subject, which I'm going to put forward. Molana has got a lot of questions as well on his side. Um, his contacts, mashallah, they want to put forward to yourself. There's been a, a question where um, talking about hijrah, um, should we, you know, uh, migrate? When will it become compulsory? Um, where should we go? And what should a person do in regards to that? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, inshallah? I think that it's a very complicated issue because um, not everyone has the means to make hijra. And even if you do have the means to make hijra, where do you make hijra to? Um, I think that 
the main thing to be concerned about is the next generation. Um, right now, Muslims can practice in, in many of these Western countries, uh, they can practice Islam and fulfill the obligations of Islam. Um, but their child, there's a threat that their children will not become Muslim or their children will lose Islam, especially those who are putting their children in public schools. So there was this question about like, oh, we can't avoid putting our children in schools. Okay, if then what you're basically saying um, is you are fine with a 90% chance of your child leaving Islam. You, you're fine with risking that. That's basically what you're saying. Uh, or you think 90% is too high. Okay, make it like uh, 20%. Or 30%. Are you comfortable with a 30% chance that your child is not going to be Muslim? Uh, is any Muslim parent comfortable with that kind of probability? Uh, I'm not, as a parent, I'm not comfortable if there's like, you know, a 5% chance. I want to minimize the kind of danger to my child's iman. So this is what I often tell parents. I said, if even if, you know, I have to take my child out of public school, uh, and they will end up just becoming, you know, a, a ditch digger or a construction worker just doing or a farmer, you know, not even a farmer because a farmer owns land. But he has, he's an assistant to the farmer. He's just milking the cows and that's his future. And he can and there's a, and he's going to be Muslim and he's going to be a believer. Then I'll take my child out of school for that. Uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Um, them getting a degree, but there's a 20% chance or a 10% chance that they're going to leave Islam because of the influence of public school. So even if I have to take my child out of school and they just sit at home and they do no, they don't do any homeschooling, they have no school. And this is actually a movement, actually. There are some, not Muslims, but non-Muslims, that they are no schoolers. They don't homeschool. Okay. They're like, oh, we want children to learn in an organic fashion and you know, on their on the basis of their own interests. So there's no schooling. That's actual movement. But uh, even if that were the case where I, I'm not, because alhamdulillah, I'm a, able to homeschool my children. My wife is at home homeschooling children. Um, even if that were not the case, we didn't have that option. It would still be better for them to sit at home. It would still be better uh, to avoid the evil, uh, to avoid the uh, the kind of shar uh, and and misguidance that lies waiting in the halls of these educational institutions, especially public school. Islamic school, that's more, uh, that's better, but still these Islamic schools have many problems. Um, unfortunately, at least in some of the these Western countries. So that's my perspective. It's an extreme, it, people might see that as extreme only because they're used to a certain model. They're used to a certain way of doing things and living life that has been spoon fed to us and dictated to us by people who ultimately don't care if we if our children are muslim or atheist or hindu or christian they don't care um that they're the ones who are pushing this idea of education um and the necessity you have to you know you have to if you don't put your children in school that's going to be uh you know the end of your child you know, your child is going to suffer and, and live a life of misery unless he goes into this uh, atheism factory. We have to question that and, and be critical and be brave enough to go against the grain. Malala, sorry, I know you got a list of questions there. Uh, just a very important question to my mind. Let's say, uh, Brother Daniel, there is a, a parent or parents sending these kids to the schools to these uh, 80 schools, as you call them, uh, or as they are, let's say these parents themselves are, you can say, to some degree, Islamically grounded. They know about the injunctions with regards to Quran and Sunnah. They have a, a good relationship with that child. This child is going into these schools, they're coming back, and obviously they're taking uh, information from this child and channeling that information in the right direction. Would he st still say that there is a, a risk factor here and there's a possibility that this child become prey to the opposition thrown at this child or these children? Also as well, just before you answer, please, uh, Brother Daniel, just a humble request, inshallah. If you can try and keep it... Um, shorter? 
sweet. Um, with yeah. all due respect, I'm not being disrespectful. I think there's a lot of questions, brother Daniel. Yeah, there's quite literally. a lot of questions. It's vibrating constantly. <laughs> We've got a list so, of questions. So what we'd rather have from yourself, inshallah. Um, you know, in the we want to maximize speech, the benefit, yeah, inshallah. inshallah. So yeah, please, if you could do that. Okay, I'll try my best, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, so they have a good relationship at home with their parents, and the parents are on the dean and teaching the proper things to mitigate the influence of the schooling system. I would say you're just rolling the dice. You know, you can throw your children in shark infested water and expect your child to come out the other side unharmed. Yeah, there's a chance, you know, that there's a chance that your child will graduate and become a very strong Muslim and uh, but there's also a chance that he won't. He'll be eaten by sharks. That's also a chance. Is it a 5% chance? Is it a 10% chance? Is it a 90% chance? You don't really know. And, you know, that's like as if I if I told someone that, hey, look, put your child, you're, you're a strong Muslim parent. You're teaching your child Islam. Send them to, uh, to spend 12 years or 16 years in a Christian college or a Christian school system or a Jewish school system or a Hindu school system, go ahead and do that. And don't worry about his aqidah. Don't worry about his beliefs. Don't worry about him leaving Islam. Yeah, there's a risk that he's going to become a Christian or a, or a Hindu or a Jew. There's a risk, but you know, you just, you're going to do your best. So would a parent risk that? That's the same thing with public school, except the public school isn't a Christian system or a Jewish or Hindu system. It's an atheist system atheistic system it's an atheism factory so that people need to have the proper understanding in order to assess the risk and the risk is really high and it's getting worse every day especially with this you know uh qom loot agenda so it's not only your child might lose his iman he might lose his gender he might come home with his boyfriend uh that is that what you want what are the chances of that let's put the probabilities <laughs> on on that happening and it's a non-zero it's non-zero chance so yeah so one there's another question here what do you say about these traditional institutes i think this is important as well uh, who are allowing mixed gatherings and coming out with modern ideas and allow deviants to attend um and thus giving them credibility what would your take be on that yeah there are um individuals uh, these compassionate imams that have proven themselves over and over again to violate the clear principles of Islam. And these are issues in which there are there is zero ikhtilaf. There is no scholarly disagreement. They are going against the uh, precedent across all the madhahib uh, and the traditional schools of thought of Islam. And this is why we are justified in labeling them as deviants. And anyone who is going to harbor such people and put them on a pedestal and invite their community to come and listen to such a person, they are a party to that deviance as well. And they're giving them credibility for which they will be questioned uh, for on, on Yom Al-Qiyamah. So this is something that is unacceptable and we should be you know, boycotting such venues. We should be boycotting such organizations, no doubt about it. Another question, subhanAllah. How to respond to women who say, I don't have to cook or clean for my husband? <laughs> and let me just let me just make a disclaimer. This is not from my uh, my side. This is from somebody ask, asking a question. <laughs> Might be thinking <laughs> Molana's uh, <laughs> wife maybe, <laughs> is Molana is going through uh, struggles and is, is put this forward. Alhamdulillah, yeah. alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Are you sure, Molana? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so how to respond to uh, to women who say, I don't have to cook or clean for my husband? Yeah, I mean, it should be asked of these women, like, um, what do, you, what is your, what are you bringing to this marriage? You know, what are you contributing? Uh, I, as the husband, you expect me to uh, work, to provide the rent, to pay the bills, uh, to pay the taxes, to pay. You know, you expect me to provide you with food and clothes, and so this is what I'm bringing to the table what are you bringing to the table or are you or are you such a amazing person so special that just your mere presence is enough <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what some people unfortunately what some women and muslim women think unfortunately because they've just been praised so much by these simps and compassionate imams on the mimbar oh their women are so amazing and wonderful and 
just you know the the exaggeration has caused this sense of entitlement from many of these women uh, who think who really think that just my mere presence you sh you should consider yourself blessed <laughs> as a man that I just you know sit here and eat your food and enjoy your house and enjoy your furniture and this is a privilege for you as the man <laughs> they really they really and truly think that and this is because the the position of a man has been denigrated and lowered in the eyes of people uh, by society by the media and unfortunately on some of these in some of these masajid some of these imams these compassionate imams are lowering the status of men they're lowering the status of the husband and when they do this the women uh, who are listening also, they, their status of the man is lower in their eyes, and they think, oh, well, I don't need to bring anything to the marriage. I'm just, uh, he's happy to have me. They get this sense of entitlement because of the messaging within media and within society, and, and unfortunately from the masajid. Another one, subhanAllah. Without defending governments in our countries, do you agree that societies in our Muslim countries are better and living amongst them is much more recommended than living in the West. This is from Kimo. Kim Abiru Sabil. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. No doubt about it. So there are, you go to a Muslim society and you don't have to uh, worry about the food being halal. You don't have to worry so much about, you know, um, gender mixing to the same extent. You don't worry, have, have to worry about missing a prayer because there are masajid and, and there's a musalla very close by, convenient. You can always, you're, you're near somewhere to pray. Um, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, ha uh, haram business dealings. You don't have to worry about riba to the same extent. And you don't have to worry about the qawm loot agenda to the same extent. You don't worry about if you are forced to send your ch child to school. Um, you don't have to worry about the teacher being a, a groomer or a pedophile or some kind of degenerate uh, teaching your child. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, so many, many benefits from living in a Muslim society. No one can deny it. Is it true that these Muslim societies are getting worse, unfortunately, because of the pressure and the influence of secularism in the West? Yes, unfortunately, that's it's things are getting worse. But for the time being... It's it's clearly there are certain places that are much better than than the West, <clears throat> and if there were if it were possible for Muslims in the West to very easily be able to uh, move to such places, they would, they would. But the, there are so many difficulties. Uh, some people can do that, but for many people, for many Muslims, it's just impossible uh, to do that, and it's not that level of darura for them to be forced. Uh, but that's always a possibility that the condition will get worse and worse uh, because there is no guarantee of religious freedom. There never has been in the West. We could reach a point or maybe in some certain countries like France, they're already at that point where they need to make hijra, uh, no, uh, hijra, no doubt about it. Well, no, just adding to that, uh, Brother Daniel, uh, this is just a question that's come to my mind. Uh, one is obviously the question I had on here was, how do you balance spirituality with the coldness of debate? Um, you know, obviously you have a lot of debating online. How do you balance that with spirituality was one question that come forward. Uh, and the second one I add to that is basically, we see a lot of the youth now, brothers, sisters, when it comes to, uh, like we've got some affiliation with uh, Imma here in the UK. They hold a lot of programs, mashallah. They take out their time. They, uh, they give time to the youth. They organize youth programs, but we still see a large group of these youngsters. They're more attracted to social media. They'll come onto social media. They'll rather watch a live from home than to actually attend the masjid. Obviously, the end goal is to get these people into this environment, the environment of the angels, the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with the second question is, how can we attract this youth and bring them towards the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the first one was, how do you balance your spirituality with the coldness of debate? So spirituality, balancing it. Um, you have to have people to advise you. You have to have teachers um, to advise you and um, keep you in check. Basically, keep your ego in check. 
because the nefs is very strong, um, especially when you have to go in a debate kind of scenario or you're constantly arguing. So the heart can become hard and um, that becomes a dangerous scenario um, with the hard heart or kibber or takebbur is kind of entering your heart. So you have to just um, find ways to uh, humble yourself. And one of the best ways to humble yourself is to submit to a teacher, um, someone who is elder than you and who is advising you and you accept their advice and you don't talk back, you don't question. Um, you say you lower your, yourself and you accept what they have to say. Um, that is really very, very critical. If you go into debate and you think that you just know it all and you're doing so well and, oh, people are praising you and blah, 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 uh, then the ego can grow and that will destroy, you know, your spirituality 100%. Um, so you have to actively um, check that uh, by submitting yourself to a teacher, to an elder, um, and even someone who can prescribe for you certain practices of tezkiyah uh, to protect yourself from kibbutz and to lower you. So someone who, ideally, someone who has like the uh, permission and the kind of ijaza or the, the, a chain of spirituality, this is something extremely important. Um, to connect yourself to, especially if you're in the domain of not just debate, even public dawa. Like this is this is absolutely necessary. Um, that's one solution. There are many more, but for the sake of uh, brevity, I'll leave it at that. Um, as far as bringing people to the masjid, um, I think that that dawa online through social media plays a big role in driving people to the masjid. Actually. Um, and because people recognize, especially if that's part of your message, you know, when you're teaching um, online and you're speaking about these Islamic subjects, I try to do that on Muslim Skeptic Channel as I keep emphasizing to people that, look, this is just online. But if you truly want a deep understanding of Islam, you're not going to get it through videos <laughs> on Muslim Skeptic. You have to go study with an imam. You have to go to the majalis. You have to go to the durus in the masjid. You have to go to a madrasa. You have to study the books. Like that's the, we have to constantly give a true representation of what it's Islamic knowledge is. And I think this is a big problem because sometimes people get the impression that, oh, I have Islamic knowledge because I listen to a YouTube lecture. <laughs> like, oh, I've become a sheikh. I've become, I, I'm qualified now to go and lead Muslims, be, and I'm an alim because I've listened to 10 years of YouTube lectures. Believe it or not, there are people who think that. There are people who have this kind of understanding of Islamic knowledge. And so we have to educate people on these platforms online that know the, the true Islamic knowledge is, is something completely different. Like what you're getting online, it, this is just you know the appetizer. This is just something that is for generality, for people to just generally feel good about being Muslim and to hold fast to the deen and, and to grow in their observance of Islam. But the knowledge to, be, to actually study Islam, that is something completely different. It requires you to go to the masjid. It requires you to go to the madrasa. It, that's go, uh, you know, start that journey and you'll see how different it is and the, and the difference in your level of knowledge as well. So that if we can give that message online uh, on on these channels, I think then that will actually, inshallah, drive people to the masjid. Inshallah. Uh, just uh, one more question, and then I think we're going to wrap it up as well um, due to time. Because Unless Brother still... Daniel wants to carry on. It's entirely up to you, inshallah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can go on for a few more minutes, inshallah. Inshallah, okay, well, yes, there's a question here. Um, I know it's 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 related to America. Uh, what are your thoughts of Al uh, Qalam Institute, which is in Texas, um, Darus Salam? Again, like we said, you don't need to answer. It's your the masala topic. segment <laughs> uh, and Darul Qasim. Um, if you don't want to answer, Alhamdulillah, you're, you're entitled. I mean, I mean, if it's a no it's comment, question. it's entirely fine, Inshallah. Well, I publicly criticize Qalam Institute. Um, Qalam Institute uh, works very closely uh, with compassionate imams and they have, you know, compassionate imams themselves, unfortunately. Um, so 
my criticism of them has been pretty consistent and public. Uh, they unfortunately will promote certain uh, distortions in their teachings and their graduates also. Um, when you see some of their graduates and what their graduates advocate, uh, it's shocking. You know, how can you claim to be a graduate of a madrasa? Qadam Institute claims to be a, a madrasa and you can, they have an alam program. You graduated from the alam program, but you're promoting all kinds of nonsense, feminism, and your understanding of Islam is so distorted. So I think they're really known by two things. They're known by their graduates and they're known by their, um, the actions of their founder. You know, their, their founder goes and has a lecture standing next to, or, or on stage presenting a speech, uh, right before Ilhan Omar, you know, <laughs> Ilhan Omar. Maybe the, he changes his identity when he's standing next to. <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, he doesn't, to be fair, he doesn't stand next to her, but he gives a speech, you know, about whatever Islamic topic, feel good message. And then immediately after the next speaker is Ilhan Omar. And so there's, so what kind of person would agree to be on such a stage where such a person like Ilhan Omar is being promoted. Um, and this is, it's not just one event, like someone could make a mistake and there's like one, he didn't know, but it's like a repeated pattern and a repeated association. So that's why I have publicly criticized Qalam Institute uh, because of this in the past. Okay. So inshallah, before we wrap up, just a cherry on top of everything. Um, do you plan to come to the UK inshallah? Um, you know, if you do come as well, I'm pretty sure the last time I checked the border control, they won't make you recite the Shahada again. <laughs> and um, there'll probably be a few questions here and there. But, but Mulana, just interested. adding to that, honestly, uh, I was just going to write this down. I'm sure you'd agree. feels like a long lost friend. Yeah, having this chat with Uda Daniel, Alhamdulillah. It'd be a pleasure for us to host you here in the UK. That's, and when do you plan on coming, inshallah? We'll see, inshallah. Um, we'll see when that happens. And we'll, I'll definitely make sure to come and visit and have the pleasure of seeing you in person and benefiting Inshallah, from Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah, brother Daniel. It was a pleasure having this discussion and I'm pretty sure many people benefited, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts, preserve you as well. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to continue our works as well. Uh, also, last one last thing, Mulana, I was telling Mulana as well. Um, there's Molana Usman's a student here as well. And as just a light, light uh, humor, um, did you hear anything from Usman bin Farooq? So I can pass on the information. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, anything. inshallah. So we'll let them know, inshallah. But yeah, yeah like I said, again. alhamdulillah, yeah. It, was a, it was a pleasure. And mashallah, a whole team. We've got a whole team behind the cameras. Uh, if we can remember them in your duas also, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless them. Molana has been taking a lot of time, a lot of stress on his head as well, trying to get this together, alhamdulillah. And uh, it's been a, honestly a pleasure, Mulana. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from, from Mulana. All the brothers here, mashallah, they hold you in very, very high regard. And uh, jokes aside, uh, alhamdulillah, it'd be a pleasure hosting you here in Birmingham, inshallah, whenever you're ready. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Tika, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.